Good afternoon and welcome to the uh, Learning Lab in uh, PCR London Valves. Uh, my name is Chaim Dannenberg. I'm an international, uh, interventional cardiologist from Cholon, Tel Aviv, Israel. And uh, we'll run a session here that is sponsored by Medtronic with the title of Procedural Aspects of TAVI Patient Long-Term Management. We've got an excellent uh, faculty with us. The chat master is uh, Raquel Deval from Oviedo, Spain. She is located in Spain right now, and she'll contact with us with questions. And I would ask the three excellent discussants uh, that we have here to present themselves. Nicolas, you first. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm Nicolas Dumonta, interventional cardiologist in Toulouse, uh, in France. Tanya? And my name is uh, Tanya Rudolf. I'm an interventional cardiologist as well from the Hardin Diabetes Center in Bad Oeynhausen, Germany. Eberhard Grube, interventional cardiologist, University Bonn. And the uh, session that we'll run uh, right now again on procedural aspects of uh, TAVI patient, how do we improve the uh, long-term management? We'll try to advance the knowledge in the long-term management of TAVI patients to learn more about the essential steps to uh, improve cusp overlap and uh, the implantation technique, and we'll try to gain some knowledge in the procedural PCI access after TAVI with some uh, case examples. And with this, we'll start with you, Nicolas, speaking about coronary access. And actually, the question before improvement of the procedure is, really, is this really a problem? How frequent it is? How severe is the problem? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I, for that, of course, we can refer to our uh, experience regarding interventional ca uh, cardiology, but also with to some data. And uh, I put it here to support the discussion, this recent revival study you, you probably also uh, published by Stefanini this year, um, that showed that the rates of unplanned coronary uh, angiography to perform PCI after TAVI is not that, that high. It's around 1%. And diving into more details in, into those data, we see that the majority of the cases occur quite um, fast after the TAVI procedure, even though the median time from TAVI index procedure to uh, coronary catheterization for PCI is just below uh, 200 days. Interesting finding from this study is that um, although it was a repartition between 36% of balloon expandable valve and 64% of self expandable valve, there were no difference in success rate of cannulation. Uh, dep depending on the type of valve, and the overall success rate of PCI was um, around uh, 96%. Now, saying a little bit more about the indication, because we told how often it was necessary, but why it is necessary, um, more or less at the acute phase, it's for acute coronary syndrome, and mainly, and you see that in that very high uh, a number of patient registry, and also in this over a study is for a non-ST elevation uh, myocardial infarction and oppositely on the long term from, uh, for chronic coronary syndrome. So the, now we come up to the question, is it really difficult to uh, can Is it really a problem? And why is it difficult? Yeah, yeah, you're, you're, you're right. Even though, it, it, as I mentioned, in some studies, there is no clear and significant difference regarding the type of valve Honestly speaking, as interventional cardiologists, we know that it can be more difficult in long frame uh, uh, valves. So, and of course, determinants of difficulty to reaccess the coronary arteries have been studied. So you have here an example summarizing all those determinants. These are anatomical uh, uh, ones related to the anatomy of a patient, mainly the aortic root geometry, and also some related to the device and the procedure, and mostly the commissural tab and orientation, the ceiling skirt height, and of course the valve implant depth. But if we can now more to uh, the long frame, uh, long frame uh, devices like the Evolute or the old core valve, we know that one of the factors with the most influential regarding the difficulty to access the coronary arteries is to have a, a, a commissural post just located in front of uh, the takeoff of a coronary artery. Any advice how to overcome the problem? How can we cannulate in the most smoother and elegant way? Yeah, yeah. So I, I can give also some driven from uh, my experience and shared by, by you, by others, of course. 
He's here, uh, he, here are uh, some advices, some summary, I would say. Um, I think the most difficulties come when the operators are not really familiar with this kind of valve. So first is to know the design, the supraannular leaflet position, the height of inflow pericardial skirt, to understand how it was implanted in the aortic root. And the first step sometimes is to perform orthography. You have a clear understanding of that. And then I would advocate strongly to use guiding catheter, even though you want to do perform a, a diagnostic coronary angiogram. Downsize the shape of those the, the, the guiding catheter. Why using them? Because while trying to manipulate them, you still have the opportunity to have an O35 wire inside that helps you to position against the frame. You have a good quality of injection, high volume of injection, and then you can make some uh, good visualization even though you don't have direct catheterization of your coronary arteries. Why and JL and JR and not yeah, EBUs or yeah, regular uh, guiding uh, catheters? I, I think it, uh, you don't have to be dogmatic, of course. Huh? You have to adapt to the anatomy. But what I mean is that sometimes as the aortic root is smaller because of the frame inside the native root, you just have to have short uh, frame and short shape guiding catheter. And I think my last message would be maybe not to lose time and energy to selectively engage a coronary ostia if it's not easily possible. Sometimes it's really easy, sometimes mm -hmm. not. And if it's not, don't lose time to do that. Just position your PCI wire uh, downstream, even though you're not selective with your guiding after, and then it will be possible to, to do. Uh, maybe you want uh, to see Please some examples? some yeah. examples, yeah. 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 So really fast. First one, this one, just to illustrate what I mentioned about the utility of using guiding after. You see here, I have my, my O35 wire inside. I can use it just to reposition myself, myself in a cell above or below the position I'm, I'm uh, currently here. And uh, I have a good quality of uh, injection and I can, if necessary, advance my wire. Uh, this example may be more extreme, but illustrates the, the overall philosophy. A patient having an MSTEMI, years after TAVI and a bypass graft on the LAD, and you see at the time of looking for the right, we don't find it. And by autography and therefore uh, unselective catheterization, we finally find that the right is perfused by this small communication between the ascending aorta and the right vasal vasalnus, but in a location that is not, not at all uh, uh, um, physiolog physiological. Quite anomalous. Yeah, yeah, quite anomalous. So here, of course, if you try to make a direct catheterization to do a regular PCI, you fail. But the idea is just to follow the flow. You see a flow, just follow the flow with your wire. And just advancing a wire following this flow, it was finally not so difficult to cannulate the right coronary artery with that. And once your wire is here, you just be able to, you will be able to descend a, a balloon. And having this balloon, use it to anchor yourself and to improve your support, advance a guiding after extension, and there, it's possible to drive a stent and to, and to do the procedure. An outstanding case. Uh, any recommendations regarding the wire, any special wire? Of course, most of the time you use really uh, um, um, easy to manipulate wire, good response to torque, hydrophilic one. Actually here it was a, a cyan, but it can be a cyan black, it can be whatever wire you want. Seeing this case, it, can, it brings us to the question whether should this be done by every interventional cardiologist or would you recommend sending to an expert center performing TAVI after a PCI after TAVI or angio sent to a, an excellence center? Yeah, I, I, I think this case again that is extreme is, is here to illustrate that it's, you just need to understand where is the flow and uh, where it is coming from. But as soon as you have understood that, I think um, most of our colleagues have a lot of experience in coronary PCI, and there was nothing really difficult regarding the PCI itself. What was difficult was to understand to where to, to go. Uh, so um, I, I would say it's just a matter of training, education, but any, uh, uh, um, I think, trained uh, coronary PCI interventionalist could do that. Okay. So just <coughs> one Please thing, Nicolas, yeah. uh, which is probably not so pertinent for us here in Europe, but if you go, for example, to the United States, where you have structural fellows and coronary fellows, we grew up with coronary 
and then moving on to structural. So we are basically, I mean, the older generation. Hybrid. Yeah, we are hybrid. <laughs> We're hybrid. But, you know, we, we know when you have a challenging case, you need some catheter skills that structural fellows don't necessarily have. Oh. This is something that you, as I said, not so much in, in, in Europe maybe, this is something that you would consider to be uh, an issue at some yeah, point? Yeah, I, 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 now listening to you, I realize it, it, is, it is an issue. And it's true that in our, I would say, uh, European background, as you mentioned, it is not because we, um, and because we are getting older also, so we, we are trained at the time yeah. uh, TAVI was not existing. So we, we started with coronary interventions, but of course, to, to do that, you need some coronary skills on top of your structural ones. Yeah. Tanya, what do you think? An excellence center or whenever uh, PCI should be done, post-AVI, every center should do it? I think we should be able to teach everybody to do it because the problem is the patient can show up in the middle of the night with a STEMI and then you don't have time to transfer the patient to a highly um, selective center because you just lose time. And I think, as Nicolas mentioned, I think we just have to train everybody and tell everybody what the tricks are. Uh, we have to be sure that these kind of patients can be treated in every center, but for sure, if we have a complex PCI um, in, in such patients and they present as a chronic coronary syndrome, of course, then we have time and then we can transfer the patient to a specialized center. But I think for non-STEMI or in particular for STEMI patients, um, yeah, we have to make sure that everybody is able to treat them. So probably the place of these sessions is not only in PCR London valves, but in general intervention and cardiology. Yeah, I think so. So, Nicholas, actually, it appears that the major determinant of the, uh, this problem is the interaction between the coronaries, the posts, the leaflets. What can we do to prevent this? Uh, other than designing new valves. Yeah, <laughs> of course. But uh, I think one of the most recent uh, improvements we've, we've had in our TAVI implantation technique is now to try to understand how to position the commissures of a, of a new valve, that is the, the commissural alignment technique, so-called. Um, and I think uh, Tanya would explain that in a, in a few minutes better what I, uh, what I would do. Uh, but uh, I think it's one of the major aspects of our new techniques. Now we can, we have some, some ways to uh, try to position the commissures of a new valve at the right place. What about the uh, new devices such as Basilica or uh, tearing the leaflets? Um, I, 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 I personally don't have experience with that. Of course, I've heard about that. I've seen the, the case reports, the publication. These are, I think, interesting uh, ways to explore. But my opinion, of course, in that is the best is to prevent <laughs> rather than to, to be uh, such aggressive after that, even though it can be useful and can save a, a patient to do so. So I would rather try to invest in the prevention. Excellent. Any questions, Nicolas? You're in charge of the uh, chipmaster yeah. as well. Yeah, right so, now. so so far we had some colleagues sharing also their their um, no questions but comments about the the usefulness of a guiding after extension uh, in the in this setting of performing PCI through an evolute or a core valve, because again, as I mentioned, the main issue is the lack of support, the lack of uh, uh, selective engagement of a coronary ostia. But once you have understood that you don't need to be selected, you just have to advance your wire and along to your wire, guiding after extension will allow you to have enough support, enough engagement, uh, avoid any friction between the stent and the metallic frame. Exactly. You, you will succeed, I think, uh, at 100% of the cases. I think that the main uh, conclusion is you need to be very liberal in uh, guide extension. I think it's so. It's not, I'll try that if I'll have a problem, but rather be very liberal, the friction with the, uh, uh, with the cells may be a true problem. And therefore, once you cannulate it, be liberal with the uh, uh, guiding extension, and I think it would indeed guarantee an excellent result. I think so, yeah. Okay. So with that, maybe Tanya will move ahead to your uh, presentation. And as promised, you'll discuss not only uh, how to improve the uh, outcome, but you'll discuss uh, commissural alignment. So actually teach us a little how to improve 
the uh, deployment and improve the uh, late outcome as well, mm -hmm. please. So first of all, um, I think we should always ask ourselves, um, why do we have to achieve an optimal implantation position in our patient? And I think the main goals, uh, apart from the commissural alignment, is the reduction of permanent pacemaker implantation rate, which is still an issue, and also to reduce uh, paravalvular leakage. And I think here it is absolutely key, uh, key that we um, have a minimal production um, of the device into the LBOT because we know that if there is too much interaction of the device and uh, left ventricular outflow tract, the risk for AV blockage is higher. And uh, so currently with the Evolute device, we should target for a maximum protrusion of three millimeters. And this is shown here, um, how this translates um, to, the, to the stand. And um, I think this is what we, what we should try to achieve in, in every single implantation. So how can we do that? I mean, yeah. go, walk us through the uh, <laughs> fine details. So I think, first of all, we need to have a projection um, where we can be really sure that the LVOT is as long as it really is. So we have to elongate the LVOT. Um, and we can achieve that um, if we travel along the S-curve uh, towards RAO caudal, because then the, the left ventricular outflow tract is elongating. And so if we, if we do that, we come to the so-called cusp overlap view. Um, it actually isolates the non-coronary cusp. Um, it travels uh, on the left side, which is here indicated uh, to be yellow. And then you have an overlap of the right and the left coronary uh, cusp. It's uh, shown here in red and in green. And with this view, um, you maintain the basal plane alignment. Um, you reduce the, the parallax of the marker band. And um, this view provides an accurate view of the root uh, regardless of the angulation. So what happens if the uh, parallax is not... Uh corrected, if you, you've got a huge parallax, what would you do now? So in, in, in our clinical practice, then usually we try to um, get completely rid of the parallax um, right. in the marker band. And um, it also can happen, of course, that uh, in some mm. patients, depending on the anatomy, you are not able to reach the exact cusp overlap projection because it's too far RAO or too caudal. You cannot reach it with your C-arm. But then you should just try to get as close as you can and get rid of the parallax of the marker band. But it's clear that the parallax is, is actually the most important. You cannot start with a with an open uh, ring in front of yeah, you. Yeah, definitely. But I mean, in, in my experience, in 99% of the cases, you, you are already get rid of the parallax when you go to the cusp overlap view. Okay, so let's go through the steps of the cusp overlap. Yeah, so I think um, before we go to the procedure, of course, we have to do some planning. So we do our usual measurement. We um, define uh, the, the three cusps. And then the only special thing we have to do in our planning is that we not only get the projection of the three cusp co-planner view, um, as I mentioned before, you travel along the S-curve towards RIO and caudal, and there you get the cusp overlap view, and you just mark the, the projection there. And um, regarding uh, the procedural steps, it's, um, it's um, in order to avoid the interaction uh, with the conduction system, you, stood, uh, you should start the deployment with the marker band um, at mid-pigtail, and you should do that in the cusp overlap projection. And what is also important, that you do slow rotation on your handle in order to achieve a slow deployment. And what also helps here to stabilize the system is pacing, a rate of 100 to 120, and this might uh, really facilitate a slow deployment. And usually the patient is hemodynamically stable when you pace at that rate. And um, so then you, you go ahead, so maybe the technique can help me and make the movies here running because I cannot do it here with the... No, this does not work. 
Yeah. Oh, that's yeah, nice. Okay. Thank you so much. So what you do when the valve is almost completely deployed, so just before you, you hear the, the rattling, then you should assess the implantation depth. You do that first in the CUSP overlap view, and then you just switch um, to an LAO projection, and you do another injection, and uh, then you should be sure that you are, um, have a little bit more than one millimeter, and not more than, than five millimeters of protrusion into the left, uh, ventricular outflow tract and then you are able to go to the final deployment. And um, what is um, necessary here is that you make sure, um, of course, that you remove the pigtail first and then you should actually pull on the guide wire so that there is no tension to the delivery system and then you should apply a, a very gentle forward push um, and um, what you can also do in this phase to get it even more stable, that you pace um, with a rate of 180, uh, but you don't have to do it mandatory, but you can do it if you like it. And here again, it's important that you do it very slowly, that to be sure that the valve stays in, a, in, in this position. So actually, your uh, policy is to pace during the, uh, in most cases you would pace during the procedure and actually increase pacing at the uh, final release? So we don't do it in our center, so we do the pacing, as I mentioned before, with mm -hmm. around 100, 120 okay. over the most time of the deployment. But in the final phase, we don't do this fast pacing. Mm -hmm. we, we just keep the 100 and 120. Yeah. But I know from many other centers that they increase their pace rate. And you can do that if you feel more, s more happy with uh, um, mm -hmm. the fast pacing or the rapid pacing. But I personally yeah. don't think that you need it. I join you here and actually we don't pace at the end but we do it very very slow yeah. we're very careful and kind of one eighth of a turn at a time and I think that's the key for uh, and it's very stable. What, what you take? No, uh, mixed between, <laughs> between the both. Um, most in the majority of the case we don't need a, a pace at, at that age but sometimes we, we do and my partner Didier loves to do that also. Um, mainly in some challenging, difficult uh, situation, I think, for example, to a very horizontal aorta or very dynamic left ventricle with very strong uh, force driven by the stroke volume of uh, LV. And sometimes in those situations, it um, allows us to have a more stable final step of deployment. Definitely. Eberhard? Yeah, that is almost, for me, a philosophical question yeah. because <clears throat> if I look back, uh, there was initially never, a, you know, a, even a pacing issue with with the release of core valve. Yeah. If you recall, Heim, it came up when the 34 was launched. Exactly. Then people were a little bit more insecure, and then came this controlled pacing up, and you know, we do it to 100 or. Uh, 120, not quite as Gen high. Gentle as pacing. <laughs> <laughs> gentle pacing to overcome the issue. Personally, I still don't. I accept the fact that many people like it because they believe it's more stable. Uh, I, I think you really don't need it unless you have a lot of arrhythmias where you, exactly. it's hard to predict. Otherwise, for me, uh, I've, I've done so many, so I, I don't really think it, it helps a lot. But to stabilize, maybe it's a good point. But if I may s ask Tanya and, and Nicolas, what I do see, people concentrate on, on overlap technique, on projection only. But they still follow the old rule, get into the ventricle, pull back, and then basically you lost the advantage. It's not only a question of projection, it's, I think anyway, it's something that you come from above, and don't get into the ventricle and pull back. Let the device come down. Uh, you, you know, you said it, let the device come down because if you get into the ventricle, you lose the advantage uh, of not touching the, the, you know, the, the critical part of the membranous septum. So I think it's important to mention not only to projection, but also the deployment the technique deployment. is a little bit different. Yeah, you're, you're right. I think that the technique has been adapted regarding that. And in my mind, I, I, because I like also this parallel, I, I compare it to how you land an airplane. Yeah. Uh, you just arrive uh, above your, your target uh, destination and then you just let the valve arrive at the correct exactly. depth and then you correct your depth and you no longer uh, go deeper. 
Excellent example. What about wire? There is, uh, at least our American colleagues are very uh, keen about using a Lambda quiz in all CASP overlap cases. What's your take here? Yeah. So I know, and I had uh, many discussions about that uh, in, in the past. So, so we are not using on a regular basis the Lindaquist wire. We just use a Safari or an Inovi wire. Um, it works perfectly well. Um, I think there are cases with a lot of tortuosity where you have to use a, a Lindaquist, but I think um, the success of this way of implantation is not based on the wire yep. you are using. Um, so I think you should just use the wire you feel most confident about, and then you can achieve uh, a really good result with that. In horizontal order is probably uh, lambda quiz, but it's not definitely not mandatory. No. But I think it's definitely key, what I mentioned, that um, when you finally release the valve, that you make sure that the valve, that there is no, no, no push on the wire any longer. I mean, in, in, in the past, we implanted the valve in a different way. So we were entering the left ventricle, and somehow pushing on the wire to let the valve travel out of the, of the ventricle. And so I think with this you have more interaction with the conduction system. Um, so you should definitely be sure that there is no push on the wire when you do the final release. That's the only totally, thing which is totally important. Agree. Releasing the tension is critical. It's not that intuitive yeah. to most of us, but we need to uh, educate ourselves to be very strict on releasing very gentle push forward and then only and only then completing the uh, procedure again very gently nice procedure but any clinical data on outcome yeah, well, I mean, so far um, there are only a few smaller clinical trials. Um, they are showing that the um, uh, pacemaker rate is really going below 10%. Um, and also very reassuring data from the Optimize Pro um, study. This is an interim analysis, and it's also showing that permanent pacemaker rate went down below 10 and I think this is a big achievement. I told you guys, I mean, a single digit numbers is actually what we uh, look for, and I think it's a huge achievement. Okay, so what about coronary uh, access? Yeah, and uh, this is what uh, Nicolas mean, already mentioned. On, yeah, yeah. <laughs> on your behalf. So. It is, it is. <laughs> Um, so the only thing I, I forgot to mention, of course, you could argue that now it's more dangerous if you if do it the other way that we implant the valve. So there were no pop out so far here in the um, Optimize Pro and also paravalvular leakage. The data is also very convincing. It even seems to be um, helpful if we achieve for a higher uh, implantation position uh, to eliminate paravalvular leakage. And now um, the commissural alignment, I mean, Nicolas already mentioned the problem is if the post uh, of the commissure is just in front of the coronary ostia, and um, we should try to avoid that. What is important to know with the Evolute system, R and Pro, is that where the C pedal is, that this is exactly the, um, where the commissure is, and what is also helpful to know is that we have this uh, head marker, and there is exactly an angle of, of 90 degrees between the C pedal and the head marker, and this helps us uh, to align the valve. And so the steps we should uh, take for that is um, when we introduce the system, we should make sure that the flush port is at, at three o'clock uh, when we introduce the system. And then um, when, we, when we travel uh, down to the valve, we should try to align the head marker at central front in the cusp overlap view, because then the right and left coronary ostia are on the right hand side of the of the um, uh, image here, and uh, there should be also um, the C tap um, to be sure that the commissure is just between the left and the right coronary ostia. And and here um, is how it looks like um, then on on the screen uh, that you have the center the the, the head um, marker in the, in the middle, and then when you release the valve, the C pedal is here on the right hand side and of course now we would ask ourselves um, how successful can we be when we do uh, um, an implantation like that and this is a small uh, study just uh, recently published in 20 patients showing if we if we follow the rules I just mentioned then we are able to achieve an optimal position in 17 out of 20 patients and um, when when we even able to rotate the system with, which is not 
possible in every single patient due to exactly. tortuosity, then we are able, even able, uh, able to achieve 100% of only a perfect or only mild uh, misalignment here in, in our patients. Wonderful. And so how strict are you about uh, commissural alignment? I mean, would you uh, fight for, to, for seeing the head marker in uh, every case? Or would you struggle or just using the uh, flush board at three o'clock and hoping for the best? What's your attitude? So, um, I mean, we definitely always do the rotation at three o'clock. It's very easy. And, um, and then we really try in every single patient to arrange the, the head marker. But as I said, in my experience, this is not possible to do it in every single patient. And then, of course, you have to make sure you have to counterbalance also the risks you are taking exactly. because you have to retract the valve. You have to go further back to a rotation when you go forward again. And so um, you... I mean, in my experience, you are able to achieve a perfect rotation in, in 90%, but in 10%, you are yeah. just not able and to. And I think that. that we should refrain of uh, pulling and yeah. going back again, the risk of scraping the, uh, the arch and stroke is too much. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask a question, Tanya? When you have an older patient, say, 80, just to give a number, 80 and above. Are you struggling for a commercial alignment or would you say the younger the patient is, the more we pay attention to it? I mean, definitely, the younger the patient is, and if there is already coronary artery disease Thank present, you. I think that's an also very important point. And I also think that commissural alignment is important when we are doing valve and valve, because there it's even more difficult to um, be able to access the coronaries. I think that the major question is indeed the coronary status prior to our procedure. And despite yeah. the studies of not touching the core or no value for PCI prior, I think that in those patients in which you put in a self-expandable, we'll try to refrain from late uh, coronary procedures. Yeah. So it's time for you to uh, conclude. Yeah, exactly. So um, I Let's think we really, over, no? yeah, as an please. implanter, have to try to achieve the optimal implantation position in order to reduce the permanent pacemaker rate and uh, paravalvular leakage. We have to make sure that we are able to uh, re-access the coronaries. And I think with the CASP overlap technique and the commissural alignment, we are able to do that. Totally agree. Thank you very much, Tanya. Thank and you. we'll move to the, our next speaker, Eberhard. Teach us a little bit about uh, TAV in TAV and how to perform the uh, procedure. Yeah, I think this is a smooth transition to what we have last talked about, and that is the, uh, the TAV and TAV situation, uh, what to consider. Because, uh, you know, a big part of my presentation is a life case. Uh, I just would like to make some bullet points here, apart from my financial uh, disclosures. Um, as we move on and we briefly touched base on this as we move into younger patients. We have to decide how do we start and with what procedure do we start actually when we uh, decide to treat aortic stenosis. Should we start with surgery or should we start with TAVR followed by surgery or should we start by TAVR? I think each individual approach has advantages and disadvantages as you can see here. For the most part, I think we should or we would agree on that we start with surgery, say 65 and younger, we start with surgery followed by, followed by TAVR. Basically, we know as we also move into younger patients that at some point bioprosthetic valves will fail, uh, that not only surgery told us, but to a small uh, percentage also TAVA valves um, um, taught us. And <clears throat> we have to consider redo TAVA or surgical intervention that will be required in a certain subset of patients. And we can see here, if we look at the TVT registry, out of 330 patients, uh, 330,000 patients, about 0.11%, a very low number, uh, was um, um, identified as TAF and TAF procedures. So the number is low, but as we can see here, as we move on, the numbers are probably increasing, <clears throat> and this graph shows this very nicely. So what, actually, what, what options do we have uh, when we look at TAF and TAF solutions? And if we look specifically 
a balloon expandable valve here, the sapient versus the self-expanding valve here, the evolute, we can say sapient and evolute, evolute and evolute, evolute and sapient and sapient and sapient. Uh, those are the scenarios that we can see. Both have, up, have pros and have cons, as shown on this slide. Note that the, uh, the self-expanding and self-expanding is off-label, but their pros are the EOAs and gradients and, and basically the disadvantage mm -hmm. uh, summarized here. And you can see even from this graph that probably a balloon expandable in a, in a self-expanding valve is the way to go. What is important that we look at the, at, the, uh, at, the, at the technique, we have to, as pointed out before, preserve the coronary axis, avoid coronary compromise, and ensure that the sapien uh, three valve um, functions well. Avoid deep implants or too deep implants of the sapien that may result in left ventricular conduction disturbances as we move into a very sensitive area, namely the, the, the septum. This is an important slide, a little bit more detailed, but what you can take is the low implant at <clears throat> uh, Evolute Node 0. Um, and you can see here the red, there's no compromise in coronary axis. Um, if we move the valve up to node 5 in, in, in this Evolute, it's probably the, the, the pinning of the original leaflets because what you want to do is you want to get rid of a stenotic uh, valve in the, in the self-expanding valve. So this is a good height, node 5, uh, no compromise in coronary axis. And if you move higher up, then you might have to deal with a problem coronary axis. As we said, coronary obstruction is something that you would like to avoid. This graph actually shows on the left side in blue. This is the, uh, the risk of coronary obstruction low initially in TAVR valves. And then as we move into valve and valve, and here are the numbers of three studies uh, in yellow, the numbers are going up and we have to pay attention. Um, on the right side, you can see what is an option if you do have a problem, and that is the basilica or slicing method, be it shortcut or basilica. Uh, you open up and slice the leaflet, and you can see the number is going down. However, we also have to consider that there are reasons and there are scenarios that you can resolve with, lamina, with basilica, but... Um, on the lower part, you can see there are also some that you are simply unable to resolve with, um, with Basilica. So the best option really is not to compromise coronary axis. And now I would like to move on uh, a case that we transmitted during the gym meeting at Haber for Valve and Valve. <clears throat> and, you know, a side patient had mitral insufficiency and tricuspid insufficiency, but that's not the topic here now. Uh, we focus on valve and valve. And this is an important slide in many ways. You can see, number one, um, that the valve is stenotic. The core valve, core valve classic, if I may say, was implanted 10 years ago and showed signs of malfunctioning by uh, severe aortic stenosis. And what is important and uh, at the same time reassuring um, that you look at the calcification of the leaflets. And for the most part, it is the basal part of the leaflet that's calcified. That is important in many ways, particularly when you look at pinning the original leaflets. You have to get rid of the stenosis, and that is usually in the basal part. And you can see here the calcification is, in fact, at the, at the basal part of the bioprosthetic leaflets. Obviously, you can see here the stenotic valve. Um, and I, I admit here that there was a long discussion with, with Jeff uh, in this particular case, not as a chief medical officer of Medtronic, but as a colleague, friend, a uh, long-standing colleague and friend. We have done many cases together, and we discussed this case in length. And basically, um, you know, we decided to put the, um, the sapien in there with all the pre-procedural planning, uh, particularly uh, reserve coronary access. And as you can see here on the lower part, there's a little bit of a critical... Uh, situation with the coronaries. Uh, it is not exactly the cutoff at 10, it's 11, but close enough to pay attention to it. And as we said, precaution is the best way to avoid a complication. And in case the, the sapien that you try to implant is moving up during deployment, which if you try to be low and you expand the valve, there's always a chance that the valve slips up and you have only one millimeter 
before you get in trouble, we decided to uh, protect the, the coronary. So this was the case. Basically, uh, I don't want to repeat that, but the procedural strategy was to do the TAVR with a 23 Sapien um, S3 and protection of the um, of the coronary, of the left coronary. Pre-procedural peak-to-peak gradient, you can see it is a stenotic valve, degenerated valve. After 10 years, it has done, the valve has done its job for the most part. And now that we can see here, the, we prepare the coronary protection with a wire. The axis was actually quite simple. We wired the LAD and then we um, positioned the stent within the, the, the left. And this is an important part. Um, you can see the S3 in the core valve, you position it. And what we wanted to do based on the pre-procedural planning, we wanted to position the S3, the uh, inflow of S3 exactly overlying the, in, the inflow of the previously implanted core valve. So inflow over inflow, because it was a high implant, we weren't concerned about conduction disturbances in this particular case. But to be honest, I was a little bit afraid that the valve would move up. So we put some pressure on it um, in order to keep the S3 in its position that you can see here. And then if you look carefully at the deployment, exactly this is what happened. While you deploy the S3 slowly, the valve moved up a little Thumbs bit up. and we had to really put pressure uh, down to keep the S3 in its original and pre-planned position, which is inflow over inflow. Um, and this was an important step here. Um, when you do the pre-procedural planning, you really have to be looking at where is the calcification and what part of the, of the bioprosthetic leaflets you want to pin with the S3. The good news here is obviously the coronary obstruction was not an issue anymore. It was good. We were able to, um, to candelate the ostium of the, of the left and it was okay. And then the check for residual peak-to-peak -peak gradient uh, was also very satisfactory, so no big problem. This was the functional assessment. Position was good. As you can see, this is what we planned, inflow over inflow, um, and there was no leak, and uh, the flow was basically free. That was the root shot, and I think it was a very acceptable uh, result uh, as, a final, as a final shot. With that, thank you very much, and I m move back to my seat. Excellent uh, case. Eberhard, I've got a naughty question to ask you. Seeing the valve in valve, and our, uh, uh, we're trying to refrain from any coronary uh, problems, uh, coronary access, would you implant a little bit deeper? No. I um, mean, we're speaking about how to cusp overlap and how to uh, deploy as, almost as high as possible. Well, I mean, there, there was, there is obviously, if you implant an S3, there's obviously some, some tolerance because of the larger cells of the S3. So it was, it was uh, difficult. To be honest, um, we were surprised, but we were, uh, we were prepared. That's why we pushed. But the downside of it is if you push too hard, that you push was, the valve into the yeah. ventricle, which obviously, would have been a bad thing. But I tell you, and the imaging doesn't really tell you the whole story. Um, it was really difficult um, to keep the valve down. Because obviously when you, when you expand slowly, you know, the calcium of pushes course. the valve up. I, I wasn't so much afraid, but we wanted, in accordance to the pre-procedural planning, we really wanted to inflow over inflow. And we didn't want to have three millimeters above inflow. Coronary access wasn't so much a problem uh, because of the, of the upper cells, but <clears throat> I was a little bit afraid of losing the, the, the opening effect and you still have the stenotic segment still being there. Yeah. That's what we tried to cover with the S3. Slow release and control. Yeah. Any questions, Nicolas, that we have no, from no, our... Uh, not, not at the moment, but um, I, um, this, this case that is beautiful, huh, Eberat, and, and uh, full of learnings, um, appealed two thoughts um, uh, from my side regarding that. First, 
that uh, we have to understand as uh, interventionalists and TAVI implanters that those procedures are, are no longer streamlined, simple TAVR uh, procedures uh, regarding the pre-procedural planning the, the, the and the procedure per se. And second, um, that is part, I think, of now of my uh, regular activity, and I, I'm sure yours also, is that now, as um, each time we implant a, a TAVI valve in a patient uh, having a long life expectancy, we start thinking about the reintervention and about all those issues. And uh, each time, um, it's something that I try to anticipate. Of course, you can't anticipate all. And uh, each time I face some anatomical, very uh, um, um, difficult or adverse conditions, I remember that we are in a field where we have uh, equivalence with surgery and that uh, sometimes we, we can come back to, to surgery in some adverse condition for the future intervention. Okay, I think we're uh, almost done. We've learned, I think, and we keep learning that TAVI is not only regarding the immediate result of uh, mortality or even conduction defects and stroke, but rather we're trying now to improve the uh, long-term outcome, refrain of any coronary uh, difficulties, uh, no pacemakers if possible, and we're touching on valve in valve, we're discussing durability issues and how to uh, tackle them in the uh, future. I'm grateful for the uh, three excellent uh, speakers, Nicolas, Tania, and Eberhard. Thanks, Raquel, in Oviedo, and uh, hope to uh, see you all again here in PCR London Val. Thank you very much. Thank you.